Hi everyone, I'm Ralph Fonte. I am a poet and physician from the Philippines. So first of all, I'd like to thank Singlet Station for this opportunity to share some things about Filipino poetry. So I entitled my presentation, uh, Sa Loob at Labas ng Bayan Kung Sawi. Uh, it's a line from one of the most famous Filipino poems written by Francisco Balagtas, entitled Florante at Laura. In English, it reads, Within and Without My Country of Grief. So thank you for joining me today. And this is a brief overview of Filipino poetry. I hope everyone learns something new today. And I hope as well that uh, you all fall in love a bit with Filipino poetry the way I did so many years ago. So the Philippines, uh, which we call Pilipinas in Filipino in Tagalog, is an archipelago of 7,641 islands. In Southeast Asia, only Indonesia, I think, has more islands than us. So the Philippines is divided into three island groups, Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao. And there are two major seasons, wet and dry. Uh, the Philippines has around 130 indigenous languages and one Creole language based on Spanish. And we have a population of around 113.8 million people. The Philippines, having 7,000 islands, uh, has a lot of indigenous languages. They're all from the Austronesian language family. However, the two official languages are English, a uh, legacy of a colonial past, and Filipino, which is based, which is a national language based on Tagalog. So the other major indigenous languages in the Philippines are Cebuano, Ilocano, Hiligaynon, Bicolano, Kapampangan, Waray, Pangasinense, Maguindanawan, Marao, Bahasa Sug, and hundreds of others. Uh, these languages are all spoken by different ethno-linguistic groups, and each has its own tradition of literature, poetry, and uh, folklore, of course. The Philippines, uh, as most of us would probably know, was colonized by three countries. Well, four. Um, we were colonized by the Spanish in the 1500s, and we were colonized by the Americans at the turn of the 19th. 19th century. And then during World War II, we were colonized by the Japanese for three years. Somewhere during the Spanish occupation of the Philippines, the British also colonized us for around two years. So all of, all of this history with uh, all of this colonial past actually figures prominently in our uh, poetry, in our literature. So I'm organizing this uh, discussion into uh, eras you know, based on our colonial past. So the first part would be about pre-colonial uh, Filipino poetry, pre-colonial indigenous poetry, then poetry during the Spanish era, then poetry during the American era, and uh, contemporary or post-independence poetry. So the first part would be about pre-colonial poetic forms. Um, currently, uh, the most popular verse form in the Philippines uh, is free verse, although a lot of people still uh, use uh, traditional rhyme and meter. However, uh, when the Spanish uh, arrived in the Philippines, they discovered that Filipinos already have uh, indigenous uh, verse forms. However, uh, it's curious to think that these pre-colonial poetic forms aren't super popular among Filipinos, and uh, I wager that most Filipinos, uh, especially those who aren't uh, super into poetry, are wouldn't really know about these forms. But I think it pays to actually look back and uh, and know that the Philippines had uh, indigenous uh, poetic forms that uh, were were recorded by the Spanish, and a lot of it was actually lost to time. And uh, the ones that I'll be sharing today are the ones that were preserved and recorded. The basic structure of the traditional indigenous poetic form had three to five lines per stanza, and each stanza was written in monorhyme, and there were seven or eight syllables per line. The first example that I'm going to share is the Diona. It's a three-line poem with a meter of eight syllables per line, though examples with seven syllables also exist. Uh, in pre-colonial times, they were often sung at weddings, and these days only poetry geeks write them. So this is an example. Sumalunga sa bundok, 
bagkus madara us os at walang kukong ikamot. So the next type of poem uh, is Atanaga. It's a four-line poem with a meter of seven syllables per line, also traditionally written in mono rhyme, but other rhyme schemes may be used. So uh, Filipino poets uh, eventually tried experimenting with the Tanaga. They also experimented with different rhyme schemes. So Tanagas with AABB, ABBA, and ABAB uh, rhyme schemes also exist. At an example of a pre-colonial Tanaga is this. Katitibay ka tulos sakaling dat ng agos ako'y mumunting lumot sa iyo'y pupulupot. So I, 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 like, I really like this poem because it's, it's an underdog poem. Like uh, it's the moss, the small uh, moss is telling this tall post in the river that when the water comes, even something small like the moss can engulf and uh, eclipse the, the height of the, of the post. Another example, uh, this is a modern example written by the poet and priest Albert E. Alejo. The title is Tanaga, and it describes a Tanaga using a Tanaga. So in Tagalog, it's Aapat na taludtod, natig pipitong pantig, sa tugma, sukat, lugod, loob ko ay naantig. So this is an example of a Tanaga that uses the ABAB rhyme scheme that I mentioned earlier. Another example is the Dalit. This is actually the most popular uh, type of uh, pre-colonial poem. And even the Spaniards, when they were recording uh, these types of poetry, mentioned that most uh, Filip Filipinos, or Indios as they called them, would, uh, would use the Dalit over the Tanaga and the Diona. So it's a four-line poem with a meter of eight syllables per line, and it's traditionally written in mono rhyme, but other rhyme schemes may be used. So this is an example of a dalit. Ang sugat ay kung tinanggap, di daramdamin ang antak. Ang aayaw at di mayag, galos lamang magnanaknak. The ambahan, meanwhile, may be thought of as, as an extended tanaga. So it's also a poem with seven syllables per line and four lines per stanza, traditionally written in mono rhyme. But there is no set limit to the maximum of number of stanzas that can exist in an ambahan. So it, it's like the tanaga, except extended indefinitely. Then, of course, uh, the epics of the Philippines were all written in rhyme and meter. However, most have been lost to time especially the epics of the Christianized ethno-linguistic groups. They, uh, it's been theorized that they were mostly replaced by Christianized epic poetry. But some examples of epics that survived colonialism are the following. First, it's Biag Nilam Ang, the epic of the Ilocanos, uh, Kudaman from Palawan, Indarapatra at Sulaiman from Mindanao, and Hudhudhi Aliguyon, which is an epic from the Cordilleras in the north. Uh, other examples of traditional Philippine poetry exist beyond these. Uh, we have folk songs. Uh, the Ivatans in the north of the Philippines in Batanes have the laji, and uh, there are various lullabies. Uh, I, I, of course, I can't make an exhausting, exhaustive list of traditional Filipino poetry, but I'd like to share uh, Muyin Parunino, which is an Ivatan laji. So this is uh, the text in Ivatan, but this is the text in English. Whose face do I behold mirrored upon the warm water I am about to drink? I dare not drink the vision I may prolong. If I die, bury me not at the cross of St. Felix. Bury me under your fingernails, that I may be eaten along with every food you eat, that I may be drunk along with every cup of water you drink. So this is one of my favorite traditional love poems. <laughs> So the Spanish arrived in the Philippines in 1521 and eventually colonized most of the country. And the Spanish colonization of the Philippines uh, was one of the uh, biggest, uh, had one of the biggest impacts, in, not just in Filipino poetry, but also in Filipino culture. 
So the Spanish colonial period lasted from 1565 to 1898. That was 333 years. It was a period of intense and long-lasting cultural upheaval because the independent polities of the Philippines became colonial subjects. So at the time, each ethno-linguistic group existed separately from, from other ethno-linguistic groups. And Filipinos lived in small political units called the barangays that had around 100 to 400 families, or even smaller sometimes. However, uh, when the Spanish came in the interest of their imperialism, they organized uh, the barangays into larger uh, settlements called uh, pueblos, uh, centered on the church, the town plaza, and the colonial government. So uh, the country at that time uh, was characterized as bajo las campanas, or under the church bells. The Philippines uh, was reorganized into a Spanish colonial state, and uh, there was a huge shift in religion and culture because uh, the people were converted from native animist Anito worship to Catholicism, and uh, most of their lives revolved, of course, around the Catholic Church and the colonial government of Spain. So poetry and language and language were used as tools for religious conversion and dominion. Uh, because of this, new syncretic forms were produced. However, there was still a predominance of uh, the use of native indigenous forms. Uh, Spanish colonialism also heralded the onset of printing and published poetry. Before, uh, it was purely oral tradition. However, the first collection of printed poetry in the Philippines uh, was published by Fray Pedro de Herrera in 1645 called Meditaciones kung mga mahal na pagninilay na sadya sa santong pag -ehercicios. So this is an example of, uh, of a verse from the Meditaciones. This is written in the Dalit form, but uh, focuses on Christian themes. So this is the, the verse in English. Wash my soul, cleanse it well, lock it, from it expel completely all grime and dirt and sin. So one example of a new syncretic verse form that was uh, created during the Spanish era was the Corrido. It's a long narrative poem famous during the Spanish era, often about Christianity, the lives of saints, or metrical romances, and maybe thought of as an extended delete, in the same way that the Ambahan is an extended Tanaka. So it, this uses uh, eight uh, syllables per line and is often, often had Christian themes and extended for, for stanzas upon stanzas. So... An example of this is very, um, it's very famous actually. It's being taught in high schools called Corrido at Buhay na Pinagdaanan ng Tatlong Prinsiping Magkakapatid na Anak ni Haring Fernando at ni Reina Valeriana sa Kahari Ang Berbanya by Jose de la Cruz. Or uh, in short, the Ibong Adarna or the Adarna Bird. So uh, these are some verses from uh, Ibong Adarna by Jose de la Cruz. So I I'll be reading the first stanza. So you guys have an idea of how it sounds. At kung yaoy matapos na ng kanyang pagkakanta, ito naman ang itsura balahibong makikita. For you to be able to last through its seven wondrous songs, I will now give you what will be your salvation. Here they are. Take them. Seven pieces of lime, a razor. These will be your cures against the enchanted bird. With every passing song, you must wound your body. Squeeze lime into the wound that you may not fall asleep. And when it finishes, its seventh song, Don Juan, you must evade the bird when it defecates. Because if you are hit by the enchanted bird shit, you will petrify, and there you will die. Kapag ikay tinamaan ng tae ng ibong hirang, magiging bato kang tunay, doon ka na mamamatay. This corrido is about uh, Don Juan. Uh, his father uh, gets sick and he's supposed to capture the elusive enchanted Adarna bird whose song was fabled to uh, cure any illness. So it's a, it's a long narrative about the, the exploits of Don Juan and him capturing the Adarna bird and what happens afterwards into the kingdom of Berbania. Another example of a um, uh, syncretic uh, poetic form is the Pasion. Now, this is uh, from the Spanish Pasion, which is uh, also uh, synonymous to the English word passion. So uh, this 
poetic form has five lines per stanza with a meter of eight syllables per line uh, is used to narrate the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, usually sung or chanted during the Holy Week in the Philippines. And actually, these days, this is still um, being performed in the provinces during uh, Holy Week. So I guess this demonstrates how, how much Christianity and Catholicism really seeped in to the uh, cultural fabric of the Philippines. So this next one, Awit, it's, it literally means song. This is one of the most popular verse forms uh, in the Philippines. Uh, it's a type of long narrative poem that became famous during the Spanish era. Each verse contains four lines of 12 syllables each with a cesura or a sm slight pause after the sixth syllable. This is the form in which the most popular Filipino metrical romance, Flor Florante at Laura, is written. Uh, this metrical romance, Florante at Laura, is the one from which I took the title of this entire presentation. Uh, the Awit is also the form in which the poems of the 1896 revolution of the Filipinos against the Spanish uh, were written. As an example, uh, I included some verses from Florante at Laura by Francisco Belagtas. So the English uh, translation was done by Marni Quilates. Mahiganting langit, bangis mo'y nasaan. Ngayoy nagniniig sa pagkagulaylay, bagoy ang bandila ng lalong kasamaan sa reynong Albanyay iwinawagayway. So if you'll notice in the verse, uh, there is a sesura or there could be a pause after the sixth syllable. So for instance, the first line goes, Mahiganting langit, bangis mo'y nasaan. So that's an important uh, feature of this verse form. Uh, and it separates, uh, it sets this verse form apart from the other uh, ones that I discussed earlier. So these are other uh, verses from the, from the metrical romance. So I'll just read the English lines so that uh, everyone has an idea of what's happening. So in, in this uh, metrical romance, Florante, the, the hero of the epic, uh, is found tied to a tree in a deep forest uh, where he was uh, trapped by his uh, political and romantic rival, Conde Adolfo. And most of the most of the metrical romance is him lamenting his existence tied to a tree and how this evil person, Conde Adolfo, was able to steal from him not just the throne of his country, but also the love of his life. And so this this is uh, these are verses from around the beginning of the of the metrical romance. Within and without my country of grief. Betrayal reigns, is enshrined, esteemed, degraded everywhere. The heart's goodness is consigned to the lowly pauper's grave. All manner of good and deed are cast into the sea of mockery and perturbation. Each good man is treated without respect, without burial, right entombed. But oh, the cheat, the traitor, the black of heart are enthroned in praise, and for each scoundrel incense is burned and offered up in fragrant smoke. And I chose these, these lines to, to feature uh, not just because they are from one of the most iconic Filipino poems that's being taught in high schools all around the country, but also because I feel like it encapsulates the current climate in our country where evil men, cheat, cheaters, uh, plunderers, murderers are being exalted all because of uh, propaganda and false news. This particular uh, scene ends with this uh, stanza. O traitorous ambition for honor and riches, O hunger for airy and fleeting praise, you are the reason for all this sinfulness, this misfortune that has befallen me, and in fact, not just Florante, but also his entire country. Then, of course, uh, verses in the Spanish era were written not just in Filipino, in Tagalog, but also in Spanish, because uh, Spanish language became a marker of learning and social class. As such, Indios, or the locals, uh, learned not just to speak and write in Spanish, but also became poets in the language of Imperial Spain. So there are a lot of examples, but our, our national hero, Jose Rizal, his poem, Mi Ultimo Adios, is one of the most famous Filipino poems. In English, it's my last goodbye. Then after the Spanish, of course, came the Americans. And uh, 
the Americanization era lasted from 1898 to 1946, so 48 years. Uh, it began after the Spanish-American War, the Philippine 1896 revolution against Spain, and the Treaty of Paris, which uh, saw the Philippines, Las Filipinas, sold to America by Spain. So after the 1896 revolution, in, in 1898, um, the Filipinos declared independence from Spain uh, after the Spanish lost the Spanish-American War, but the Americans refused to acknowledge the declaration of independence by the First Philippine Republic, precipitating the Filipino-American War, which, of course, the Philippines lost. <laughs> and because of this, nationalism and the struggle towards or against Americanization became a major literary theme. Uh, all Filipino writers at the time uh, struggled with uh, Americanization. So some of them advocated for Americanization, but a lot of uh, the more, a lot of the writers also uh, advocated, advocated against it, seeing the Americans as just another colonial imperialist power. So English replaced Spanish as the language of colonization, opportunity, learning, and prestige. However, uh, what marked the American era uh, as different from the Spanish era was that um, the Americans uh, established a public school system that used English as a medium of instruction. So this era, because uh, of the suspicion with which a lot of Filipino writers viewed the English language, uh, this era was marked by a flourishing of poetry in indigenous Filipino languages, as well as in Spanish. However, there, were all, there would also become Filipino writers who were educated in English, who would start writing in English. This struggle between embracing uh, American-influenced literary innovations and sticking to and experimenting with a more uh, nativist view of poetry uh, was one of the biggest struggles during the early part of the 20th century. The critic Virgilio Almario coined balagtasismo as a term to illustrate the literary movement or impulse that emerged in response to American colonization. Uh, this balagtasismo was uh, coined after Francisco Balagtas, who wrote Florante at Laura, and who also was the most revered Filipino poet at the time. So, because... Uh, a lot of Filipino poets uh, viewed the Americans with suspicion, balagtasismo, the literary movement that rejected American influence, was characterized by orality, patri patriotism and nationalism, a sense of social engagement, nativism uh, and conservatism, and an adherence to form. Uh, because at the time, Americans were introducing free verse, so uh, the Filipino poets would consider a, a strict adherence to form as more nationalistic. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, the former language of colonization, Spanish, came to be viewed as an instrument of resistance against the Americans. So instead of using English, uh, Filipinos would use Spanish for, for intellectual discourse, also would use indigenous languages. However, uh, the writers in the indigenous languages would come to view writers in Spanish as their allies against the writers who wrote using the new language of colonization, which is English. This example, By the Sea, by Ildefonso Santos, or Satabing Dagat in Tagalog, is an example of uh, balagtas a, a poetry written after the tradition of balagtasismo. So Satabing so Dagat, uh, I'll read the first verse in, first stanza in Tagalog, then the rest in English. Marahang marahan, manaog ka irog at katailalakan, maglulunoy katang payapang payapa sa tabi ng dagat. Di na kailangang sapnan paang paang binalat sibuyas, ang daliring garing at sa sakong nawari kinuyom na rosas. So as you can see, this uh, verse is still in rhyme and meter. However, they deviated from the usual uh, Awit form of uh, 12 syllables per line, and they divided it actually into 18 syllables per line, except formatted differently. So in English, it reads, by the sea. Ever so slowly descend, my love, and we shall walk, and we shall saunter in peace by the sea. You will scarcely need to protect your feet like onion skin, your fingers of ivory, or your heels that seem like rosebuds. We shall cross 
while it is early, a uh, rice field where blanketed by grass and the tears of stars. On our toes, we'll chase each other, quick as wind and soundless until we reach the quiet sands. Upon reaching the water's edge, you'll retreat as if suddenly coy and I shall sway you with the sight of all the tide's bounty. There, there are mussels, oysters, clams, all enticing. Would we not fill our basket before the height of noon? When the sun sets, we shall return from whence we came with wounded feet and skins burned by sunlight. It cannot be helped, love, for even in these seas of delight, everything, including the heart, is ever so slowly falling apart. So this is actually one of my most favorite love poems. And I hope I translated it properly so that you guys appreciated the poem as well. Uh, all, of course, at the time, some Filipino poets also wrote in English. So this is a poem by Trinidad Tarosa Subido entitled Paganly. God, but I do worship you. None like adoration, no, like a bird. So faith natural as a breath. I shall pray when prayer is lips caprice, like the thrilling of a bird, impulse stirred. God to me in prayer is a song to bird in air, elemental, not sacramental. So the finest expression of balagtasismo came in the form of balagtasan. It was a new form developed in the 1920s in response to the growing Americanization of Philippine letters. And it's a poetic joust in rhyme and meter often written in the awit verse form, which was constructed uh, to celebrate the birthday of Francisco Balagtas. So the Balagtasan is uh, two poets with opposing stances uh, debating on stage mediated by Alakandi when everyone is, uh, is uh, speaking in rhyme and meter. It was initially performed in Tagalog but was adopted by the various regional Filipino languages, became called Crisotan in Kapampangan and Bukanagan in Ilocano, and it became a national phenomenon, was inter- intensely popular, that huge uh, whole stadiums were filled uh, with people, and uh, people would uh, um, come to blows, actually, because of the outcomes of Balagtasan and uh, with supporters of one poet, uh, uh, heckling and eventually coming to blows with the supporters of a, of a different po- poet. And uh, the Balagtasan uh, was very famous for most of the 1900s, but eventually, of course, grew more rebund towards the 1970s. However, it's the finest expression of the impulse of Balagtasismo because it's uh, the, the topics he debated about were usually socially engaged, were usually about Americanization, about Filipino society. And it was oral. This was uh, all uh, oral literature. And um, often, Balagtasan, during that time, glorified uh, the impulse of uh, nativism and glorified uh, traditional culture versus uh, American-influenced culture. Then, of course, eventually, modernism uh, influenced Filipino poetry, which was a rejection of the predominant Palagtasismo and a clear result of Americanization. So it's characterized by a sense of interiority, a focus on self-expression, a socially disengaged esoteric mood, an embrace of free verse, all of which are antithetical, of course, to to the practice of uh, Balagtasan and the Balagtasistas. So the most prominent proponents of modernismo in Filipino poetry are Jose Garcia Villa in English, a national artist for literature who was influenced in turn by E.E. Cummings and the other poets in in New York around the 1920s and 1930s, and Alejandro Abadilla in Tagalog. Uh, Jose Garcia Villa would be more successful introducing modernism because English had less of a tradition to follow than Abadilla's Tagalog, which uh, had a lot of uh, old guard that protected the trend of balagtasismo from turning into modernismo. So this is an example of a modernist poet uh, from the Philippines by Jose Garcia Villa. The, the title is The Emperor's New Sonnet. And it's The Emperor's New Sonnet. Uh, then next, uh, this is an example uh, by Carlos Angeles. So the title is Gabu. The battering restlessness of the sea, 
insists a tidal fury upon the beach at Gabu and its pure consistency havocs the wasteland hard within its reach. Brutal, the day-long bashing of its heart against the seascape where for miles around, farther than sight itself, the rock stones part and drop into the elemental wound. The waste of centuries is gray and dead, and neutral where the sea has beached its brine, where the spilt salt of its heart lies spread among the dark habiliments of time. The vital splendor misses, for here, here at Gabu, where the ageless tide recurs, all things forfeited are most loved and dear. It is the sea pursues a habit of shores. So this is an example of a modernist Filipino Tagalog uh, verse uh, during the American era. So Quiet by Gonzalo K. Flores. The crescent moon stared at the owl on the skeletal hand of the cotton tree. So this is a rare poem at the time because it used free verse and is very introspective, very quiet as the title itself purports. So eventually the Philippines uh, became independent from America. However, uh, Americanization continued and continues to this day. So uh, current Filipino letters were influenced heavily and is still influenced heavily by trends in America. So an example of this is how Filipino poets after independence were enamored by new criticism. About Filipino independence, we gained independence in 1946. Uh, the struggle between Balagtasismo and Modernismo continued in Tagalog. However, in English, Modernism, uh, of course, won that uh, easily. And as for the languages of poetry, English continued to be the language of education and prestige. Poetry in Spanish grew more ribbon and became extinct. Writing in Tagalog began embracing Modernismo and poetry in regional languages continued, but innovation stagnated. Filipinos, Philippine writers eventually became enamored uh, with new criticism, which was a trend in America. It was a formalist movement that emphasized close reading to discover how a work of literature functioned as a self-contained, self-referential aesthetic object and intensely favored the virtues of irony, paradox, tension, texture, and the objective correlative. And what is uh, glaring about this is that uh, poet poetry written in the new critical mode uh, did not often concern themselves with huge uh, expressions of uh, solidarity with social movements in the Philippines. So eventually, this new criticism was embraced in Tagalog by a new generation of poets. Uh, the poets writing for the dawn at the University of the East and Heights at Ateneo de Manila University. So these include poets like Rio Alma, Bienvenido Lumbera, and Rolando Tino, uh, who are all national artists for literature. And with the influence of the Iowa Writers' Workshop in America, uh, that gave birth to Suleiman University National Writers' Workshop, which was the first national writers' workshop in the Philippines. And uh, until now, uh, national writers' workshops have a huge stake and uh, influence in the literary community. So this poem, uh, Lament for the Littlest Fellow, this is by Edith Tiempo. This is uh, a poem in the new critical mood, but originally written in English. So it goes like this. The littlest fellow was a marmoset. He held the bars and blinked his old man's eyes. You said he knew us and took my arms and set my fingers around the bars with coaxing mimicries of squeak and twitter. Now he thinks you're another marmoset in a cage. <laughs> a proud denial set you laughing, shutting back a question far into my mind, something enormous and final. The question was unasked, but there is an answer. Sometimes in your sleeping face upon the pillow, I would catch our own little truant unaware. He had fled from our pain in the dark room of our rage, but I would snatch him back from yesterday and tomorrow. You wake and I bruise my hands on the living cage. And this next one uh, was written by Lamberto Antonio, originally in Tagalog, which I translated into English. I found myself back at the primary school. I found myself back at the primary school. It was once a carnival of goats, pigs, and carabaos, and was once latrine of some of my neighbors during long vacations and every weekend. It is no longer the few bare rooms patched with bamboo strips and roofed with perforated cogon, 
where the classes discussing Pepe and Pilar and good manners were easily visible to the cockfighters passing by. There is now an arch of steel and wire over the gate. There are now enclosing walls, a fancy flagpole, a stage, and the basketball court engraved with a glaring donated by Governor Mocong de los Oros and granted by Don and Doña Pilipito Palpatok. On the cement sidewalk, on the ledges and pillars of the small corridor, and on the lower portion of the concrete walls, as if in line, the names of which most are patrons from elsewhere crowd about each other. A few were classmates who were dull-headed, cheaters, bullies, or those who would pee in their shorts when taking tests, or if not, had doctor or engineer or attorney attached to their names. Every door had a sign with the name of a teacher, Mrs. Monai, who loved picking her ears, is still here. Mr. Pangan, who loved chewing on bubblegum. Behind the building, I could read the thick lettering about approaching women on the pillars, seemingly of the nursery, on the trunks of papayas with overripe fruit, on the heap of plank fragments with traces of termites. Just because I was freed up from my travels as a carpenter, I was asked to visit the elementary school that once lent me my youthful experiences. With my hammer, saw, and float, I acquiesced. As they say, this is the only way I know of looking back to where I came from. I did not complete having had to stop school when I was orphaned by my parents. I just came here to place a roof over the comfort room, smoothen its walls, the new school year already around the corner, and somehow, upon this place, also engrave my name. However, this new critical mode was eventually replaced by po protest poetry because dictator Ferdinand E. Marcos Sr. declared martial law in 1972. And the atrocities of martial law and the, and the military inspired poets to return to the social obligations of literature. So they started writing, again, verses against graft and corruption, against the disappearances of people and protesters and uh, even ordinary citizens. Uh, wrote, they wrote against the tortures that was happening, the massacres that were sanctioned by the government. And the rallying cry became Panitikan Mula Samasa, Panitikan Tungo Samasa, which in English is literature from the masses, literature for the masses. And because of this, poetry in the vernacular languages took center stage. And in the years that followed, many writers would be arrested, tortured, and killed for writing literature critical of the evil Marcus regime that has unfortunately found its way back to the places of power in the Philippines. And our current president, Marcus Jr., uh, is trying to whitewash all of the crimes that their family committed during the 1970s and 1980s. However, it's important to note that a lot of poets, a lot of writers, uh, bravely took up, took up their pens and wrote against the atrocities and spoke truth to power and sought to inflame the hearts of the people so that uh, eventually, in 1986, the Marcus regime was overthrown. So this is an example of a poem, a protest poem uh, written during that time, uh, entitled Prometheus Unbound by Jose F. Lacaba. I shall never exchange my fetters for slavish servility. Tis better to be chained to the rock than bound to the service of Zeus by Aeschylus from the poem Prometheus Bound. Mars shall glow tonight. Artemis is out of sight. Rust in the twilight sky colors a bloodshot eye. Or shall I say that dust sunders the sleep of the just? Hold fast to the gift of fire. I am rage, I am wrath, I am ire. The vulture sits on my rock, licks at the chains that mock emancipation's breath, reeks of death. Death, death, death shall not unclench me. I am wind, earth, and sea. Kisses bestow on the brave that defy the damp of the grave and strike the chill hand of death with the flaming sword of love. Orion stirs. The vulture retreats from the hard, pure thrust of the spark that burns, unbounds, departs, returns to pluck out of death's fist a god who dared resist. 
but honestly, this poem is an acrostic poem that spells out the following words. Marcos, Hitler, Dictador, Tuta. Or in English, Marcos, Hitler, Dictator, Dog. And this poem was uh, interestingly published by, an, uh, by a pro-Marcos uh, literature organ because they weren't able to see the acrostic because the poem on its own passes as a good a new critical uh, poem that has Greek references and uh, uses iambic, uh, iambic meter. And this is an example of uh, how uh, poetry was written at the time. It had to be clandestine. It had to be, had to be um, subtle and not, uh, if published uh, in mainstream outlets, not blatantly critical of the Marcos administration. And to avoid incarceration, torture, and death, Jose F. Lacaba had to write this poem under a pseudonym called uh, Ruben Cuevas. So eventually, martial law ended, uh, the Marcoses were ousted, and we, now we come to the contemporary Filipino poetry scene. So after the Marcos era, uh, English had a resurgence uh, in the literary scene. So now, most literature is written in English and in Tagalog or Filipino. However, uh, there is a resurgent interest in writing poetry in the indigenous Filipino languages as uh, enabled by literary contests, independent publishing, literary journals that publish in the indigenous languages, spoken word, and of course, the mother tongue-based mother language education. Some recent examples are the following publications, Bari Bari by Roy Vadil Aragon, written in Locano, Lugas sa Balas by Jezreel E. Hilbuena. Uh, this is um, uh, Cebuano. Ang Satuyang Kakanon sa Aral Daw by Christian Sendon Cordero. It's an anthology of Bicolano poems and Pagdakop uh, sa Bulalaka, Uban Pang Mga Balak by Merli Alunan, also written in Bisaya. Contemporary Filipino poetry is characterized by a return to orality. So for a while, poetry was confined to the page and uh, the poem was conceptualized as a thing off the page. But the Filipino concept of poetry has always been tied to its oral tradition. However, since uh, the death of Balagtasan, uh, poetry in its oral form hasn't really been mainstream. It's always existed, but since the after the ousting of Marcos, um, there was a return to poetry as a thing of the page. But performance poetry in early spoken word did exist in the 90s, uh, pioneered by Vim Nadera, considered uh, the father of performance poetry, Lord De Vera in his Radioactive Sago project, uh, spoken word band, and Elisa del Carmen Guevara also had uh, an album, a spoken word album in 2004 called Reaching Destination. Pukit Wason had Romancing Venus in the 2000s, and MTV, or uh, Michael Corosa, Teo Antonio, and Vim Nadera also founded MTV and continued Balagtasan uh, in the 90s and 2000s. However, the major shift happened when spoken word uh, entered the scene in the 2010s. There was a resurgence of interest, mainstream interest in poetry. So spoken word, as introduced by, to the Philippine uh, consciousness, came from the American tradition. So uh, this was pioneered by Words Anonymous in around 2012. And uh, because they grew viral, they became very famous, uh, there was an open mic phenomenon. Every other cafe would have... Um, open mic nights every Friday where uh, poets and uh, poets, uh, wannabe poets and new poets would uh, come on stage and share their poems uh, following the hugot aesthetic, which was mostly sappy love poems. A lot of poetry collectives would be founded and eventually uh, all of this would be refined and would meld uh, with the tradition, with the long uh, uh, tradition of orality of Filipino poetry. Initially, there was the page versus stage dichotomy debate in the Philippines, uh, and a lot of uh, there would be there was a lot of gatekeeping keeping during the early uh, years of spoken word. However, uh, because of uh, self publishing culture and because of uh, an interest in a resurgent interest in poetry, both written and performed, uh, the dichotomy has since. Uh, receded or it has ceased to exist. So contributing to this was the self-publishing culture, Bukang Bibig, the anthology of spoken word um, poems, uh, Bikas Pilipinas, a uh, radio show, uh, which invited a lot of uh, spoken word artists and also 
page poets to recite their poems and the the open mic night ang sabinla which uh, I did in 2019 which I organized with uh, some other poets um, where we invited both uh, spoken word artists and page traditionally uh, page poets to uh, share the stage and recite their poems to a listening audience. Uh, the current landscape is also characterized by a democratized publishing scene. So academic publications and the production of poetry uh, previously were only confined to university presses and academic literary journals. However, uh, over the past 10 years, uh, I guess uh, a major factor uh, towards this was the founding of Better Living Through Xeroxography. So for the past 10 years, uh, publishing uh, has seen more of a democratization. So more people are publishing their own work, uh, self-publishing, and a lot of independent presses are coming out. So Better Living Through Xeroxography, uh, founded by Adam David and poet Conchitina Cruz, is an annual small press expo where uh, creators are encouraged to sell their zines, chapbooks, and other self-published books. So that started the entire movement. And now self-publishing is in vogue. Uh, poets would create their own poetry chapbooks and sell them. A Quago Book Bar uh, is uh, an institution that encourages self-publishing and uh, a lot of its um, uh, wares that it sells, a lot of the books that it sells are either self-published or Filipiniana. And recently, Uwu Books, founded by poet Paolo Tiausas, is selling uh, solely self-published uh, books to audiences all across the Philippines through Shopee. There's been a surge of independent presses uh, because of a limited commercial publication of poetry in the Philippines. A lot of independent presses uh, popped up to fill in the gap in the demand for poetry seen during the past 10 years. And of course, independent literary journals also cropped up. Uh, so aside from the popular literary magazines, Liwayway and other uh, mainstream publications that have reduced readership, uh, Independent literary journals, uh, as enabled by the internet, uh, came forward and uh, expanded the publication scene in the Philippines. Because previously, literary journals uh, were mostly confined to the academe. So now there are a lot of independent literary journals because the internet is a cheap way of distributing poetry. Uh, a lot of independent literary journals have now started flourishing as alternative venues where uh, poets can get published. And I think this is all good because uh, from 10 years ago where there was a, only a limited number of uh, platforms where poetry can be consumed and published, now uh, it's only the, the poetry community is only growing and growing. Then the literary workshops are also a huge uh, part of uh, contemporary literary poetry culture. So Lira Poetry Workshop is the only exclusively, uh, it's the only workshop that focuses on Filipino poetry exclusively, meaning uh, poems written in Filipino, the national language. Uh, University-based national writing workshops are also uh, considered ivory tower. So they're one of the most uh, significant institutions in the poetry community. But there are also independent uh, poetry workshops uh, that, are, that are either collective-based or workshops for spoken word or offered by individuals who do poetry. Then recently, there has been a resurgence of protest poetry because of Dutertismo and the Marcos Restoration, uh, because of the atrocities during the Duterte regime, including summary executions, tokang, and the extrajudi extrajudicial killings, massive corruption, historical distortion. Not, a lot of people have been speaking, out, speaking up more, uh, especially uh, recently. Uh, poets figured prominently uh, in the pink movement of Lenny Robredo's candidacy for president against uh, Marcos Jr. So and we, the poets embody the politics of hope and use their art to protest the impending and eventually the successful return of the Marcos clan. So uh, there was a, the resurgence of uh, protest poetry can be seen in uh, various literary anthologies uh, being published against... Uh, against atrocities, against historical distortions. Poetry collections such as Louis de Vera's Marca Demonio, which is blatantly uh, critical of Duterte's war on drugs. And spoken word in performances, shows, and events uh, over the past six years have been uh, vocal and blatantly critical of atrocities performed by the government. Uh, and also, I'd like to hazard that rap is also a form of poetry, and there has been a lot of protest rap 
in forms of albums, EPs, and singles. Uh, a prominent one would be Collateral by Balakid and Felix. And uh, a prominent rapper, Glock9, is one of the foremost examples of protest rap. In the Philippines. So some other prominent themes that are being written about in the Philippines are feminism, gender identity, eco-poetry, and the climate apocalypse, and also the Filipino diaspora. And a lot of Filipinos and Filipino Americans uh, and Filipinos based in other countries have uh, been establishing the presence of Filipino poetry in the international stage. So poets like Romaline Ante and Eunice Andrada have been winning a lot of uh, awards recently and have been uh, the face of uh, Filipino writers all over the world. So these are just some of our Sastrawan Nagara, or like national artists uh, for literature, who are poets as well. And finally, uh, these are the current challenges and opportunities that face contemporary Filipino poetry. So there is authoritarianism and historical distortion, uh, prompting a lot of pro protest poetry to be written, but also it poses a danger to a lot of writers who are critical because we know that the government has a tendency to red tag and jail and persecute its uh, critics. Uh, then, the, of course, the literary centers and distribution. So uh, there is now a more democratic uh, form of uh, literary community in the Philippines. It's been decentralized. A lot of Filipino poets have also been published internationally, not just uh, poets from the diaspora, but also poets based in the Philippines. And a huge opportunity, I guess, for us, because now we're in the Sipo Rhyme, would be translation and multilingualism across ASEAN. So uh, sadly, uh, we can't really read uh, each other's literature, poetry, right now, if, especially if they're written in the native languages without being translated into English. But hopefully, because of more initiatives such as Sipo Rhymo, we'd uh, be able to engage each other more and translate each other's work into each other's languages and have more of an appreciation of the literature and poetry that's being written all across the region. And above, above everything, uh, that is what excites me most about Southeast Asian Poetry Writing Month. So, that was my presentation about uh, Filipino poetry. Uh, again, I am Ralph Font. I'm a poet. I'm a physician based in Palawan in the Philippines. And thanks for listening. I hope you picked something up from my short discussion. Again, maraming salamat. And see you guys in Facebook and, of course, in our gatherings online. Can't wait to read and hear your poems. Thank you. <laughs>